Hello and welcome to A Theory of Everything, brought to you by the European Institute of Science and Management and hosted by yours truly, Jose Luis Razo Bravo. Today, we're actually not talking to Bernardo Castro. We had plans to talk to him, as I mentioned in a previous video, and we actually did talk momentarily, but before we started the exchange, Castro decided he didn't want to be interviewed. As far as I can tell, he was not comfortable with what I had in mind for the exchange. I was really surprised, to be honest, and felt really bad, but I had to respect his decision, of course. I hope he and I cross paths at some point in the future and can eventually talk. Since I had everything prepared, I'd like to spend a few minutes to tell you about his book, The Idea of the World, in the context of our mission at ASIM. I'll tell you the good parts and the not-so-good parts, and I'll explain why the work of Yakir Aharonov, which we've talked about many times on the channel, is problematic for Kastrup's ideas. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to make a couple of preliminary comments about why today's message is important and why, in my opinion, it's worth listening carefully to what follows. As always, I've placed timestamps in the video description for you to skip around at your convenience. So, Preliminary point one, I want to be clear that although Kastrup's book is about idealism and materialism and consciousness, we're not here to just talk about these things. Our mission at ASIM is not a philosophical mission, and it's not entertainment. Our goal is to make practical, real progress on the most important question facing humanity today, which is how we're going to keep from destroying ourselves as a species. The fact is that we are living through the most profound management crisis in the history of humanity. This crisis has many different faces, but they're all encompassed in some sense by the fact that the world is full of nuclear bombs. If you let this sink in, it's kind of like allowing small children to live in a home with live high voltage electrical sockets. This is not just an analogy. This is the way things really are at the moment on the planet, and it makes no sense. In my opinion, addressing this should be the number one yardstick by which any serious thinker measures the ultimate value of their ideas. Nothing is going to matter to anybody if humans cease to exist. At least, nothing's going to matter in this world. The second point I want to make before we turn to Kastrup's book is a recurring theme on the channel, and it bears repetition. It's the concept of interpretation in science. The fact is that science is always open to interpretation. In fact, interpretation, or how we tell stories, has played a fundamental role in all aspects of human history, and in the history of science in particular. The fact is that we are storytelling beings by nature, and stories have consequences, not only in our day-to-day -day lives and in the civilizations we build, but also in the scientific models we create. Many people, and sometimes even accomplished scientists, seem to overlook this. Let's listen to Nobel Prize-winning physicist Richard Feynman trying to get this point across. Suppose you have two theories, A and B which look completely different psychologically, have different ideas in them and so on, but that all the consequences that are computed, all the consequences that are computed are exactly the same. Suppose we have two such theories, how are we going to decide which one is right? No way, not by science. However, for psychological reasons, in order to get new theories, these two things are very far from equivalent, because one gives a man different ideas than the other. By putting the theory in a certain kind of framework, you get an idea what to change. And every theoretical physicist that's any good knows six or seven different theoretical representations for exactly the same physics, and knows that the two, that they're all equivalent, but he keeps them in his head hoping that they'll give him different ideas for guessing. As Feynman makes clear, interpretation and stories matter in science. They matter in his words, because different interpretations give a person different ideas about what to change in our models as we search for the next big breakthrough. 
The word breakthrough here is key. Science is always looking for breakthroughs. But the biggest breakthrough of all, the one on which all lower order breakthroughs depend, is the one that shows us how to keep from destroying ourselves as a species. We're never going to make any progress on any breakthrough whatsoever if we bomb ourselves out of existence. Any proposed story or interpretation of reality, whether idealism or materialism, panpsychism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, UFOs, or any other, should be interpreted or evaluated first scientifically, but when two models are scientifically equivalent, they should be they should be then evaluated by what they have to contribute to the ultimate question of how to protect ourselves from extinction. Okay, so for the sake of clarity and emphasis, let me quickly summarize the two previous points. In philosophy and science, it behooves us to be clear about our goals and about the role of interpretation in reaching these goals. What's being proposed is for us to agree that any scientific story or interpretation of reality that gets us closer to our number one goal of, pre of preserving human life should, other scientific things being equal, be preferable to any competing story that has nothing to say about this matter. <clears throat> this seems like common sense to me, yet scientists rarely or never assess their own ideas by this standard. If this doesn't change, as Stephen Hawking and many others have argued, nobody is likely to live another 100 or maximum 500 years to talk about it. Okay, now having said that, let's now finally turn to Kastrup's book, The Idea of the World. Kastrup himself is often credited with single-handedly leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism. Idealism, for those who don't know, is the notion that reality is all mental. Having carefully read his book, I understand why Kastrup has earned his reputation. He's written a phenomenal and compelling book with powerful arguments that cover a lot of ground. He incorporates evidence from multiple disciplines, including physics, biology, neuroscience, psychiatry, and philosophy. It's impossible for me to do justice to even a fraction of the book here, so let me simply recommend the book for anybody interested in these questions. I would draw special attention to chapter 14, which is Kastrup's interpretation of the physicalist worldview as a neurotic ego defense mechanism, and chapter 15, where Kastrup lays out his hermeneutic of the world, which is to say his interpretation of nature, as a teleological dance in which the goal is to figure out one's purpose in life. Goals are at the heart of Kastrup's hermeneutics, as well they should be, and we can't go wrong with that, in my opinion. It's great stuff worth reading. I can't emphasize that enough. On the other hand, there is an important hiccup, a technical hiccup, in Kastrup's argument for idealism. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to lay out the basics of the problem here and make myself available for a deeper dive with Kastrup or with anybody else in the future. In a sentence, Kastrup's argument for a mental universe is hinged to a large extent on his assertion that the so-called hard problem of consciousness is fundamentally unsolvable. He claims that the problem arises from an inability to distinguish mental abstractions from observable facts. I've taken a screenshot of the relevant quote for your convenience. The hard problem of consciousness, for those who don't know, refers to the idea that in science as we know it today, the quality of an experience, what it feels like to be something, cannot be reduced to matter. Some people say science will never be able to explain experience. Others argue that it's a matter of time. Kastrup compares the impossibility of solving the hard problem of consciousness to the story of Alice in Wonderland, asking readers to imagine that it was really possible, as Lewis Carroll did when he wrote the book, 
to separate the Cheshire's cat's smile from the actual cat. Kastrup continues the analogy by arguing that this is like imagining ripples of water without the water, which can't be done, according to Kastrup. He says we can separate ripples from water mentally and grammatically, but not physically, and trying to do so boils down to a meaningless language game. The problem for Kastrup is that his argument is directly refuted by the work of renowned theoretical physicist Yakir Aharonov through an experiment known, coincidentally enough, as the Quantum Cheshire Cat Experiment. In it, Aharonov and his team perform a measurement on an intrinsic property of a particle at a location that is different from that of the matter of the particle itself. In fact, a number of teams from around the world have applied Aharonov's technique to separate neutrons from an intrinsic property of neutrons known as spin. The spin of a particle is thought to be inseparable from it, like a ripple is inseparable from water. The experiment in question involves sending beams of spin-polarized neutrons through an interferometer. Researchers perturb the neutron state just enough to measure the phase change without destroying the state, which is known as taking a weak measurement. With these weak measurements and with careful selection of initial and final boundary conditions, what we might refer crudely to as retrocausality, the researchers are able to determine the neutron's spin from one arm of the interferometer while simultaneously knowing that the neutrons themselves went through the other arm. In other words, these experiments demonstrate that cats and their smiles can be abstracted from each other, which is precisely what Kastrup argues is impossible to do. As such, Kastrup's strongest argument against materialism falls apart, and his argument for idealism is seriously weakened. To be fair, another team of physicists have argued that the quantum Cheshire cat effect can be explained by standard quantum mechanics. But here, note two things. First, the team in question openly acknowledges that the empirical results of Aharonov's quantum Cheshire cat experiment are correct and valid. Emphasis here on the empirical results, because this is not philosophy. But the same team argues that these results can be interpreted more conventionally. I've provided the relevant quote on the screen and welcome you to pause and read it carefully. Most important of all, however, note that whether one interprets the Cheshire Cat experiment using standard quantum mechanics or using Aharnov's retrocausal approach, the empirical fact is that the spin and the particle are separated, which is what Kastrup claims cannot be done. This has important implications for consciousness and for the age-old mind-body problem but we don't have time for that rabbit hole today. What's more important is to note how we come back full circle to the role of interpretation in science. Remember that we presumably agreed at the outset of this video that any interpretation or model of reality that gets us closer to our goal of reducing the risk of human extinction is preferable to models that are powerless in the face of our existential dilemma. In this regard, Kastrup openly acknowledges that he does not have any answers. Given the urgency of our situation, and given Aharonov's counter to Kastrup's claims, it stands to reason that we should continue to look for a more promising ontology, one that is not refuted by empirical evidence on the one hand, and in addition, can be rigorously connected to human survival. In this regard, I'm happy to point listeners to two previous discussions with channel guests, one with Carl Fristin and the other with Fields medalist Michael Friedman. In each of these cases, the ontologies being proposed, which are physicalist in nature, can and are in the process of being linked to social science. ASIM is happy to be at the forefront of this endeavor. I invite you to listen to the channel's inaugural lecture and or to read 
our book on the topic called The Definitive Management Book, in which we link the latest advances in theoretical physics to a very concrete voting mechanism that, according to our argument, will not only minimize the threat of human extinction, but also maximize the prospects for universal human flourishing. I'll leave free access to the book and to a related TEDx talk I gave on the idea, as well as many other relevant links in the video description. If you disagree with anything I've said and would like to talk about it on camera, please let me know. I'd love to have you on as a guest. Thanks again for your interest. Thank you.